Praise the Lord. We've been talking about the churches of Revelation. And uh, I think we're on the fifth church, Sardis, tonight. The first letter to, was written to Ephesus. And uh, Ephesus was commended for their steadfastness in opposition to false apostles and false religion. They were condemned for losing their first love with a call to repent and return to their first works. The Lord informed them that he would remove their candlestick from its place if they didn't repent. He promised to those who overcome access to the tree of life in the paradise of God. The second letter that was written by John under the unction of the Lord Jesus Christ himself was to the church at Smyrna. They were commended for their faith in the middle of tribulation and poverty. There were no words of condemnation. Uh, there was no derogatory statements in regard to this church. Jesus promised to those who overcame the crown of life and to not be hurt by the second death. They were being oppressed and opposed by those who were non-believing Jews there in the city. But the Bible actually called... Uh, but they are actually called, these non-believing Jews were actually called the synagogue of Satan. The third letter was to the church of Pergamos, and the church of Pergamos was living in some very difficult circumstances. Praise the Lord. One of their own had been martyred. Pergamos had a civil government, the Bible says, under the rule of Satan himself, the seat of Satan. The church at Pergamos as a whole had been steadfast to the faith at great cost. They had members who were teaching compromise with their sinful culture. The letter instructed them that they needed to repent or Jesus would come in judgment against them. The fourth letter was to the church at Thyatira. They had great works, kindness to the poor, love, faith, and patience. Constant improvement in all these things. They had good works, but they were condemned for tolerating false doctrine in the church. Especially, the Bible pinpoints a woman in the church and called her a Jezebel. But uh, this was because many think that her name was not really Jezebel, but that she identified greatly. She uh, mimicked the Jezebel of old in the Old Testament. She taught many in the church to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idol. So she was teaching wickedness there, and the church was tolerant it, tolerating it. The Lord said he would kill the children of this Jezebel like this Jezebel like woman if they did not repent. Either way, the doctrine would cease in the church at Thyatira. To the ones that had not received or tolerated this false doctrine, they were told to hold, hold fast until the Lord came, and he would give to him the morning star. And then he said, He that will listen, let him hear what the Spirit is saying. Now, this fifth church that John wrote to us about was the church at Sardis. And, of course, this church, again, was thought to have been started by the Apostle Paul. Sardis was located at the junction of five main roads. It was 30 miles southeast of Thyatira. It was, at, it was at one point a center for trade and military might. It was once the capital of the old Lydian monarchy, associated with names such as Croesus, Cyrus, and Alexander the Great. It was located on an inaccessible plateau that was 1,500 feet high. This should have been an invincible fortress, yet it had been conquered twice in its history for failure to keep watch. It was a center of worship for a false god named Artemis. In ancient Greek mythology and religion, Artemis is the goddess of the hunt, the wilderness, wild animals, nature, Vegetation, childbirth, care of children, and chastity. The Roman equivalent of Artemis was Diana. Sardis was famous for production of wool garments. Garment making was big business in this city at one point. Sardis was the most ancient city in Asia Minor, founded around 1200 B.C., in A.D. 17, it was destroyed by an earthquake, but was later rebuilt uh, with Emperor Augustus' help. At the time of John's writing, the city was just a shell of its former glory. Let's read the text, Je uh, Revelations 3 and 1. 
And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest and art dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments. And they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. But I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Everybody said, Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Rick and Hope, it's good to see you here tonight. Praise the Lord. Brock, good to have you with us tonight. Brock, did I say it right? Blake. All right. Blake, it's good to have you here tonight. Blake was looking around, going to welcome Brock. <laughs> Good to see you, Brock. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. All right, let's dig into the, to the first scripture. Revelation 3 and 1, And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God, and the seven stars, I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest, and art Dead. Of course, and unto the angel of the church, we covered this ad nauseum in the other letter. So we know that this, this letter was written to the pastor or the bishop of the church at Sardis. Now, I dig, I d dug in there and I couldn't find out who this might be. There's no known uh, reference to who this might be. So whoever he was, this letter was written to him. These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God. Or he that hath all the fullness of the Spirit is another way that it could be put. One writer stated, this implies that Jesus has infinite power by the Spirit to convict of sin and of a hollow profession. Now, if you look at this, the seven spirits of God, this type of symbolism is used in other places in the Word of God to show God's power and authority to reprove and remove sin. In Revelations 5 and 6, and I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. And Zechariah 3 and 9, the Bible reads, For behold, the stone that I have laid before Joshua, upon one stone shall be seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave the graving thereof, saith the, Lord of hosts, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. So this symbolism is thought to, to speak of God's authority, his, his, his omnipresence, his ability to, to judge and remove sin and reprove and to make things right on the earth. Moving on, I know thy works. Of course, he he's said this in the other letters as well. He knew who and what they were. He knew what they were about. He knew their modus operandi, so to speak. Just like he knows all people's intents and thoughts. Praise the Lord. That thou hast a name that thou livest. That thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. It is believed that the church was active in its external works. They were, they, were, they were working in the community. They were seen as a church that was alive. But the Lord knew who they really were and what they really were about. In spite of all their activity, in spite of, of all their works, the Lord pronounced them as being dead, asleep at the switch when it came to the workings of the Holy Ghost. In other words, they looked good. They looked the part, they acted right, but deep down inside they were dead. What do you think? We've got to be careful, don't we? We can look the part, 
but we can be dead on the inside. Jesus addressed this sort of thing in Matthew 23 and 27 when he said, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and all of all uncleanness. Paul addressed something very similar to this in his letter to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 5. He said, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. You see, the church at Sardis may have looked good. They may have looked like a church. They had everything looking like everything, all their ducks was in a row. But in reality, they denied the power of God. They didn't walk in the will of God. They seemed to be out of touch with God. Praise the Lord. Because the one that sees all, knows all, pronounced them as dead, even though they seemed alive. In Revelations 3 and 2, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. We'll take the first part of that scripture. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. Wake up, straighten up, fly right, stay awake. Wake up, stay awake. Strengthen and invigorate the things that are barely alive. Strengthen, make stable, make firm. Now this word, uh, the word that transliterates to strengthen here is terizo. And it means to set fast, to turn resolutely in a certain direction, to confirm. In other words, it's saying, and sterizo the things which remain. Set them fast. Turn resolutely in a certain direction. Confirm them. This word sterizo carries the idea of urgency, like do it now. Be resolute before it's too late. This is, a basic, this is basically a command to get with the plan, get with the program, straighten up, fly right, wake up, be alive. Fix it. Strengthen these vital things that are just about dead. Things such as moral convictions, good desires, the fear of God, tender, pliable hearts are all about to become deceased. Do something now. Praise the Lord. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Your deeds, your actions are far from right in the sight of God. What you are doing is not meeting the requirements of the Almighty. When I was studying the scripture this week, the thought kept running through my head, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for warning Sardis. Because I know you have no respect of persons. And I know what you did for Sardis, you'll do for Dwayne Butler. And you'll do for Danita Butler and Bill Jones and Carlton Coon and Jonathan Sabochi. You'll give us a warning. He told them, you're not doing right. Your deeds, your actions are far from right in the sight of God. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord God, for the warning. God always warns his church if we will listen. Look, you never say, God will warn you if you'll listen. Revelations 3 and 3, Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt know, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent. Remember the lessons you've received and heard in the past. Remember how your lives were built on the word of God. Remember when the word was your source of strength and wisdom for all of life. Repent and hold on to them again. Turn back to me again. Do something now. Turn back to me now. Remember how it used to be. This reminds me of, a, of the warning he gave to the church at Ephesus. Praise the Lord. Sometimes I think we get bogged down so much with life that we forget how it was when we first received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I see a lot of wily veterans in the house tonight. Some of you have lived for God longer than I've been alive. 
But sometimes maybe we get so bogged down with life that we fail to remember how it was when we first received God. You see, living for God should be fresh. It should be new. We should renew ourselves in the Holy Ghost regularly, praise the Lord. Living for God should never get old, right? Even though sometimes we allow it to get old. Because we get bogged down in the crossing of the T's and the dotting of the I's and trying to make everything perfect when we need to get back to where we used to be with God. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. If you refuse to wake up and watch, if you refuse to stay awake, if you stay in your sleepy lifeless state. Jesus state that is stating here that he will come as a thief in the night. I will come when you are at least expecting it. I will be there when you least expect it. As I just said, the Lord always gives warnings before his swift judgment. In Proverbs 29 and 1, the Bible says, He that being often reproved hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed and that without remedy. He that being often reproved hardeneth his neck. You know, sometimes if judgment doesn't come speedily, as the Bible says, we just keep on going in the way we're headed. That's the way I was when I was a little boy. If mama didn't tear my rear end up, I'd just keep on doing what I was doing. If she knew how to use that belt, she put me back on the straight and narrow. The Lord will give us warning after warning after warning. And then when it's time for judgment, it will come swiftly. If his warnings are not heeded, his judgments are swift and will be unexpected. Revelations 3 and 4, Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments. And they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Let's take the first part of that. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments. Though the church as a whole was dead... According to the scripture, there was still a few faithful. There was a remnant there that had not defiled their garments, had not fallen into compromise, had not fallen into the above condemnation that we've read. They had not defiled their garments, but they had stood. Even though around them there was a lot of dead church, they stayed somehow faithful and alive, even where there was death. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. They will walk with Jesus in white garments. In Revelation 7 and 9, the Bible reads, After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne, and before the Lamb clothed with white robes and psalms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I want to have one of those white garments. What about you? Hallelujah. They are worthy. Now, I got to thinking about this. What made them worthy? Was it because they deserved to be there? Was it because of all the works that was going on in the church? all these external things, all the churchy looking things that were going on, is that what made them worthy? No, they didn't deserve it. They were worthy because they didn't defile themselves with the worldliness that most in the church were involved with. Listen, just because sister so-and-so or brother so-and-so is doing what they're doing doesn't mean that you and I have to do it. Everybody that cries, Lord, Lord, won't enter in. You know, <laughs> I heard somebody say one time that, that standing in a church doesn't make you a saint of God any more than standing in a garage makes you an automobile. You <laughs> Praise the Lord. You know the sad thing when you, when, when you get to praying and you get to thinking that that everybody that you love and everybody you hold dear, everybody's not going to make it. 
Now, I hope we break those odds here at Calvary. I hope we break those odds. The Bible gives us the church globally, I guess the church, if you look at it that way, there will be two in the bed, one left, one taken. Two at the meal, one left, one taken. So we're going to beat that here at Calvary, right? There's going to be greater than 50% of us. I think we need to nudge that 99.9 and get on up to 100% of Calvary is going to make it. Praise the Lord. Five wise, five foolish virgins. We're all going to be wise, aren't we? We're going to make it. Not because of anything we can do, but because we're not going to defile ourselves with the worldliness. We're not going to defile ourselves with things that are happening around our world. Praise the Lord. But they were worthy because they didn't defile themselves. Praise the Lord. Revelations 3 and 5. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment. The one that is victorious. The one that overcomes. That does not conform to their present world. That didn't buy into to the way the majority of the church at Sardis was acting as most of the church there was dead according to the word of God. Again, these folks that overcome is promised to be clothed in white raiment. Now, we talked about white raiment just above, and I thought it was kind of odd that it's talking about white raiment again. Now, Pastor Kuhn has taught us that the Bible doesn't do anything by accident. Right? When it repeats itself, there's a reason. So I, I got to looking at this. It's repeating this thing about white garments and white raiments. And I thought about this. I think this would have been very meaningful to people that were in the garment making business. As the people of Sardis were. So maybe he was making a point to them about this white raiment and how to have it and how to achieve it and how to, how to get it. So... So he was promising them white raiment for those who overcome. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. The one that overcomes, his name will remain in the book of life. I want my name in the book of life. Hallelujah. I will not blot out his name. The one who overcomes, I will not blot out his name. Now, if you look at the opposite of that or the additive inverse of that, if one does not overcome, if one does not awake, if one does not snap to, if one doesn't follow after the will of God and, and become alive, that one, if you take the opposite of what the Scripture is saying, their names will be blotted out of the book of life. I have no interest in having my name blotted out of the book of life. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In Revelation 20 and 12, the Bible says, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now, what concerns me about the scripture is that if, if I'm understanding what, what the Spirit is saying to the church at Sardis, that there is a possibility that your name will be blotted out if you're not awake, if you're not living for the Lord, if you're not doing your best, if you're not living by faith, and then whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. So there's going to be people that find themselves in a devil's hell in the lake of fire whose name was once written in the Lamb's book of life. I don't know about you, but that bothers me. That bothers me tremendously tonight. Those that are going on that are have already been laid to rest in a cemetery somewhere. We can't do anything about that. Let me tell you something. We can make sure that our names are in the Lamb's Book of Life. <laughs> we, 
We can make sure our names hadn't been blotted out. Praise the Lord. I want to be there. I want to hear him say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Praise the Lord. I want Dwayne Butler written there. What about you? What about you? Turn to your neighbor and say, I must be there. Revelations 3 and 6. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Every letter has ended with this. If one will listen, he that hath an ear, he that will listen. Just because I got a set of ears doesn't mean I'm listening. We'll probably talk more about this next Wednesday when my wife and I double teams and talks about communication in the home. Some of you men looking at me like, "Uh uh-oh. Just because we got ears doesn't mean we listen. He that will listen. He that hath an ear. He that will listen. All of these people had ears. This is not saying he that has an ear. This is saying if you will listen. Listen to what the Lord is saying to the church. All right. Conclusion. Let's talk about a couple things real quickly. From this letter to the church of Sardis, we've learned that a true church can become a dead church. We can... We learn that a church that used to be alive can become a dead church. We cannot allow that to happen to us. Praise the Lord. We've learned from the letter to Sardis that he that does not wake up, that does not overcome this present world, even though he once had his name in the Lamb's book of life, it can be blotted out. One thing we've learned is that Jesus judges us individually, not as a congregation. Do we understand that? When we stand before God, we're going to be there simply by ourselves, judged according to our works. We're on our own in this life and in the next one as well. We will be rewarded or judged on our own. Philippians 2 and 10 says that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Whoever is going to kneel before God. Billions and billions and billions and billions and billions of people are going to kneel before the Lord and confess who He is. I want to do my confessing here. Jesus gives ample time and space to repent and to resume a life lived for him if we'll take advantage of it. Those that overcome will be clothed in white raiment with the Lord Jesus in heaven. Hallelujah. I want to be there and I want a white robe. Praise the Lord. And I want to lay my crown at his feet. I want to hear him say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. But to get there, we got to be alive here. I don't want to be so busy with works that we die on the inside. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Let's stand and love God. Thank you, Jesus. Lord Jesus, I love you tonight, God. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for this people, Lord Jesus. We want to be alive in you, Lord Jesus, full of faith. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, we have faith to believe, God, that a mighty revival is going to break out in these end times, Jesus. That Calvary, Lord God, is going to reach into the harvest, Jesus. Hallelujah. Send us, Lord. We're praying that you will send people into the harvest. Send us, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thanks so much for being here with us today. One thing we truly value at Calvary is community. And whether today is your first time joining us or Calvary has been your church for years, we truly want to connect with you. Make sure to stay connected with us throughout the week online at springfieldcalvary.church and on Facebook. We believe God has something unique to say to you. And our hope is that you feel His love stronger today than ever before. Thanks again for being with us and have a wonderful day, a wonderful week in the Lord.